Before I go any further with my story, now would probably be a good time to give you, the reader, a crash course on Indonesian history, culture, religion and geography. Without this basic information, the rest of this book is going to make about as much sense as an inflatable dartboard. So Indonesia is an archipelago of some 17,000 islands, with the largest islands comprising of Sumatra, Java, Kalimantan, also known as Borneo, Sulawesi, Timor and Papua. Indonesia is both technically and legally one united country, however in reality it's more like a federation of different countries, with each region encompassing its own culture, history, religion and language. The Indonesian archipelago is thought to have first been inhabited by humans approximately one and a half million years ago. However, the first traces of civilization dates back around 1300 years ago from the Sri Vijayan people of Sumatra, who were predominantly Buddhist and Hindu. The Sri Vijayan Empire would later go on to kickstart many other civilizations in Java and other Indonesian islands. Around 500 years later, in the 13th century, Arab and Indian migrants would eventually dominate northern Sumatra, bringing with them Islam. This Islamic influence would gradually spread towards the east to Java. Europeans first traded and later colonised parts of Indonesia from the 16th century onwards. Eventually all 17,000 islands of the archipelago would fall under Dutch rule. The Dutch would have a large influence on not only technology and civilization in Indonesia, but also the language. There are around 600 or so native languages which either exist or did exist in Indonesia, with each one completely different to the other. This naturally created problems in regards to important things such as trade, as nobody could bloody understand each other. The Dutch standardized the Indonesian language with Bahasa Indonesia, the official language of Indonesia today. Bahasa Indonesia, or Bahasa for short, is a mixture of Malay, Javanese and Dutch. Although Bahasa tends to be the first language of Indonesians living in the more urbanised parts of Indonesia, for the more rural areas it is spoken as a second language after their native language. In 1942 the Japanese invaded the Indonesian archipelago, freeing Indonesians from Dutch rule only to replace that rule with a much harsher dictatorship. However, many Indonesian nationalists used this invasion as an opportunity to gain independence, such as the famous Indonesian nationalist leader, Sukarno. Sukarno, gambling that the Japanese would eventually lose the war with the Allies, waited patiently for an opportunity. By the end of World War II, with neither the Dutch nor the Japanese to worry about, Sukarno's nationalist movement would seize control and declare independence in Indonesia. The Netherlands attempted to recolonize Indonesia following their independence using both military and diplomatic means, however to no avail. In 1949, the Dutch government finally conceded and formally recognized Indonesia as a sovereign nation. Sukarno, Indonesia's first president, would implement a policy known as guided democracy. As this oxymoron would suggest, Sukarno's politics weren't particularly democratic. Some people were a bit unhappy with this new dictatorship and wanted their own independence, namely the people of West Papua. Sukarno and his allies weren't going to let this happen. The following decades would be paved in armed uprisings, land grabs and even genocides. Indonesia would gradually evolve into a partial democracy, however even to this day the military still have a great deal of power over democratically elected officials, and corruption in all branches of the government is rife. It's worth noting that Indonesia's neighbour, Singapore, gained their independence from the British Empire at around the same time. Singapore, unlike Indonesia, is one tiny island with next to no natural resources. It would later emerge to become a superpower of the East. Singapore, although like Indonesia also has a questionable human rights record, has a high GDP per capita. It's clean and virtually crime and corruption free. 
The key to Singapore's success was that, unlike Indonesia, their independence was gained peacefully through a transition period. They kept a great deal of the legislative and political framework of their predecessors, together with all of the technology, commerce and infrastructure. Due to the way in which Indonesia gained their independence, for the most part, they needed to start again from scratch. It's important to note that although Indonesia is a predominantly Muslim country, the majority of its provinces are secular, with a small minority of Buddhists, Hindus and Christians. With the exception of the Aceh province in northern Sumatra, which is under Sharia law and has public caning for such trivial offences as wearing immodest clothing, Indonesia at a federal level is not an Islamic theocracy. It's nothing like Saudi Arabia or Iran, at least not yet. Most Muslims in Indonesia are very moderate. Some Muslims simply attend their local mosque every once in a while in order to keep up appearances with the local community, shortly before nipping down to their local bar and getting drunk in the evening on their local moonshine, commonly known as Arak. But the lack of religious enthusiasm from some Indonesians doesn't take away the fact that there is a mosque on pretty much every street. And unlike most mosques we see in the Western world, they do indeed announce the call to prayer at full blast from large megaphones located on each tower, five times a day, starting at 4.30 in the morning. It wouldn't necessarily be so bad if all the mosques within earshot were synchronised to start at the exact same time and with the exact same song. It also wouldn't necessarily be so bad if those singing through the microphone could actually hold a tune. However, sadly neither is the case. Needless to say, it's not always easy to get a good night's sleep in most parts of Indonesia. Indonesia has a population of just over 260 million people, with almost half of that population living in the island of Java. Java is by many standards severely overpopulated, with a population density of around 2,500 people per square mile, which is similar to that of Bangladesh. Although Indonesia as a nation is fairly wealthy and a member of the G20, the divide between rich and poor is massive. Poverty is rampant on most islands. The ugliness of this poverty is in stark contrast to the beauty of Indonesia's natural landscape. Indonesia boasts hundreds of thousands of square miles of rainforest, which covers much of the mountainous terrain. The coastline as well is remarkable, with white sandy beaches, colourful coral reefs, palm trees and turquoise blue water. Unfortunately, pollution, deforestation and overfishing have destroyed a great deal of this nature. Large chunks of the rainforest are routinely set on fire to make way for palm oil plantations and beaches in the more populated areas are covered in litter. The larger cities like Jakarta are immense under thick layers of smog from all the gridlocked traffic and if you go swimming at your local beach don't be too surprised to see plastic bags floating in the water with a very occasional used nappy. It's hard to tell those things apart so it's best just keep your distance. However, there are still plenty of regions of Indonesia which are for the most part unspoiled by humans. Old heritage sites such as Komodo Island, around 200 miles east of Bali, and Raja Ampat, a group of islands off the coast of Papua, being two such examples. Although the natural destruction of large parts of Indonesia has indeed been devastating, it is always reversible. It's just a question of when the damage will be reversed. I hope sooner rather than later, but I'm not going to hold my breath. Indonesia is also sitting on top of a gold mine, quite literally. The Grasberg mine in Papua is by far the largest gold mine in the world, and also the second largest copper mine in the world. Indonesia has a great deal of wealth from precious metals, coal and oil. However, this natural wealth doesn't tend to be spent on important government services such as education and healthcare, 
both of which are poorly funded. If Indonesia combined their natural wealth with a Singaporean-style government, it truly would be a world superpower with an outstanding quality of life for its citizens. The Indonesian archipelago and surrounding islands are located on what's known as the Ring of Fire. In other words, there are volcanoes everywhere. Although many of these volcanoes are for the most part dormant, there are still quite a few active volcanoes, 127 to be precise, with some of those volcanoes erupting on a regular basis. Between 2010 and 2018 alone, 798 people have been killed by three separate volcanic eruptions in Indonesia. Every once in a while, there'll be a mega eruption somewhere in Indonesia. In the 1800s, two such mega eruptions from Mount Krakatoa and Tambora killed over 107,000 people globally. Approximately 75,000 years ago, Mount Toba in Sumatra erupted so violently that the volcanic ash cloud plunged the entire planet into darkness for several years and wiped out an estimated 98% of humanity globally. Humans came very close to becoming extinct because of that one volcano. What's left over from Toba today is an island the size of Singapore, laying in the middle of one of the world's largest and deepest freshwater lakes. Today, its pleasant scenery and serenity actually makes it a very nice place to visit for a holiday. It's dormant now, however it's not extinct. It will erupt again, it's simply that nobody knows when.